On this episode of Marketing Mavericks, we talk to keynote speaker and New York Times bestseller, Joel Kamm, about how to engage on Twitter, what social network sites are for you, and why real life networking still works. Coming up next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth from Marketing Mavericks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This episode of Marketing Mavericks is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the easiest way to create a beautiful website, blog, or online store for you and your ideas. Go to squarespace.com and enter offer code MM at checkout to get 10% off. This is Marketing Mavericks, episode 50, recorded Monday, April 6th, 2015. The Art of Tweeting. Welcome to Marketing Mavericks, where we talk about everything at the intersection of marketing and technology. And today we're going to talk a lot about Twitter. Yep, how do you actually maximize using Twitter as a business? We've talked about it before, and we've had lots of feedback to actually talk about it again. This time we decided to bring New York Times bestselling author, Joel Com. Welcome, Joel, to the show. Hello, Tanya. How are you? Good. I, I neglected to mention, I mean, you, you got to meet him before the show. Anthony Nielsen, our technical director, also with us this morning. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> there he and, is. Uh, and I'm your host, Tanya Hall. And uh, Joel's going to join us and talk about uh, not your books. Now, how many books have you written, Joel? Uh, a dozen now. And, and like 40 ebooks and reports. Yikes. That's a lot of books. It's a lot of writing. <laughs> I enjoy uh, creating content and I keep, I'm like a kid with a, a pail and a shovel and I just keep finding all these different sandboxes to play in. And when I find something interesting, I want to share it. What, um, before you started, became, before you became this New York Times bestselling author and you've uh, started writing books and started giving advice on how to use social media specific and how to sell and, and all this kind of integration for marketing and sales into the web. What did you do? What was, how did you get started in your career? You know, I got started a long time ago with computers. I bought a TRS-80 in 1980. I had a Model 1 with 4K of RAM. So, you know, I dated myself now, but I've always been a geek and enjoyed using computers. And in 1995, I, uh, I moved from being a, an entrepreneur as a mobile disc jockey, because I got started in radio, uh, to building my first website. So I had one of those sites back in 95. Uh, it turns 20 in July. Oh, my gosh. Where's the time? <laughs> yeah, you just totally oh, added yourself. Seriously. And uh, my first big hit came in 97. Uh, when I built a multiplayer gaming site. I didn't code it, I did the marketing, and a uh, friend in uh, California had built the foundations of one of the web's first multiplayer game sites where you can hook up and play chess checkers, bridge, backgammon, and we called it classicgames.com, and that subsequently ended up getting purchased by a little company known as Yahoo, and became the foundation for what is now known today as Yahoo Games. Well, there you have it. I had a friend of mine actually built the first uh a little pinball game on your your Mac computer. So a lot of people got started in gaming. Why? What? So it, I mean, you obviously you sold. You became Yahoo. It became Yahoo Games. Why? Um, why change? I mean, you you. This is a pretty big difference in your business now, right? From how you got started. <clears throat> why aren't you well, still in gaming? Uh, you know, it's been from one one thing to the next. Like I said, I get, I'm easily distracted. Oh, squirrel. And, you know, <laughs> whatever is interesting to me at the time is what I get into. So I built one of the first deal sites uh, back in uh, 1999, dealofday.com, which has been sold. I've created WordPress themes. I've had a number one iPhone application. And uh, so that's kind of gaming. So it was a novelty app, uh, which you may have heard of, called iFart. Yep, guilty. I did that. And, um, and I just, you know, social media seemed like, um, just interesting to me. I got into it when MySpace was coming up and I had Facebook and Twitter accounts in 2007 and they thought, you know, when you had 5,000 followers on Twitter in 2007, that, wow, you must be really something. And of course that's, you know, it's nothing now, but the, uh, the, uh, John Wiley and sons asked if I would 
write a book on how to market Twitter. And so Twitter Power, How to Dominate Your Market One Tweet at a Time, became the top selling book on how to use Twitter for business. And there it is. And just there came it is. out with version 3.0. It uh, just came out this week and um, updated with, uh, with my friend Dave Taylor, who you probably know of AskDaveTaylor.com. What a name, AskDaveTaylor.com. I should have AskTanyaHall.com now. Just kidding. Yeah, it's a great site. He's been doing daily uh, Q&A for, well, forever. And uh, he's got a popular site. And we had Guy Kawasaki write the foreword to this third edition. Yeah, so, Guy, uh, Guy's uh, been on this uh, network quite a bit. Of course he has. Guy's <laughs> everywhere. He's <laughs> everywhere. Everywhere you turn. Guy, he's there. He's, he's there. there. A shiny object. Um, so, okay. So let's talk about um, the book for a minute. And then I want to just kind of drill down on just industry specific things. But... Let's talk about your book. Why what, Why would somebody be interested in picking up um, a book about how to use Twitter? Not everybody actually uses Twitter, right? So you don't have, it's a social networking site that not everybody uses. Um, I'd use it. I've used it a lot and I see huge uh, opportunities for businesses and media and that sort of thing. But um, so who's who's the, the profile of somebody who would be interested in getting your book? Who is that person? Okay, so there are 284 million active Twitter accounts. These are people that are tweeting every week. Okay? At least that's according to Twitter's uh, actual numbers. That means people are gathering here like they gather at the water cooler. Anywhere there's that many people, uh, that means your prospects and your customers are there. And you can't ignore anything that big. Uh, if you're not there, your competition is. And whether you're there or not, your prospects and customers are probably talking about you. And so uh, as a marketer, you want to go where the people are gathering because that's where your message can be heard. So, you know, everybody likes different social networks. I actually use Facebook just a little bit more than Twitter because for me and my brand personally, that, that kind of interaction um, really works for me. But using Twitter for as many years as I have, I've also seen firsthand just how powerful it is. You know, when I put a blog entry out there and it gets 200 uh, or so shares every time, that's that means that the message is getting around and, and getting out there. And of course, you know, Twitter is becoming more like Facebook in many respects. The only thing that's holding them back is the 140 character limit. And I actually, uh, there was news that just broke the other day that Twitter is increasing the character limit by one character. And of course, that news was on my blog on April Fool's Day. But, uh, you know, it's because you get to the end of your tweet and you always, there's that one character. <laughs> You've got to have the exclamation point. And darn it, if it doesn't fit, the whole tone is shot. That's a whole nother conversation just around even the the language that we speak today and yeah. how the web is changing. I, I've talked about that kind of thing. Hashtag. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's hashtags, it's abbreviations, because you know, we've got Twitter, which is a... 140 characters. We have um, shortcuts in tweeting. And it's funny because you always have all these grammar Nazis, right, on uh, on social media. And I'm like, you guys, the language is changing and younger and younger people aren't really recognizing what we traditionally thought of as the right way to speak and, and write. And, and I think language is going to change. And we're going to continue to see that evolution, I, I think, because of the internet. And, and as marketers and people who are trying to communicate, uh, you know, ideas, content, we have to get used to that. And I, I think um, younger and younger people are going to read. That's my personal. That's like a little. Do, do kids even know what a pound sign is? Do the kids even know or, these days? They don't know what a pound sign is. It's not a pound sign. It's a hashtag. That's right. It's totally changed. And of course, I think now they actually come out of the womb with a mobile device in their hand. So, you know, it's it's changed a little bit. Yeah, it's it's completely changing. So you mentioned that the one of the first networking sites that you got on was MySpace. And uh, I think we've all, I've got an account there, but I'm not really sure I know how to get into it. Um, I, need, I need to well, just... It's kind of laughable now, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, trying to bring back MySpace. I, I don't know who's actually using it. I know, I think when they announced they were coming back, we all looked and then went, why? Yeah, well... Definitely when, uh, when it launched, you know, originally like in, you know, I don't know, 2005, 2006, um, there was an opportunity to really u utilize the service. Um, and my, you know, I remember getting on there for the first time, uh, because my nieces were on it and, um, I wanted to be connected to them. But what I realized quickly was that, as we all did in this marketing space is that consumers really want to connect with pe people. Uh, they want to connect with brands and they are active as a marketer. I saw this as a huge opportunity, but all the sites are a little bit different. So MySpace was enabled those types of conversations. 
Uh, Facebook certainly enables those types of conversations. Twitter is a lot different. Twitter is a much different type of social networking site. And not, as I mentioned before, not everyone utilizes it. Um, so why would it be a beneficial, I mean, again, you know, so you're in business. Is it better for the small business person to get on Twitter? Is it for the, the you know, big brands who are utilizing it, media? I mean, who's the ideal beneficiary of marketing on Twitter? The answer is yes to all of the above, right? Whether it's a small brand and you're doing local marketing, there's been a lot of case studies of, you know, local pizza and dry cleaners. Because people will ask, anybody know a dry cleaner in Austin? And boom, somebody will, you know, that lives in Austin will tweet, yeah, I love these guys. And before you know it, those guys are in on the conversation and they're sending a coupon to the person locally saying, hey, say $5 on your first dry cleaning with us. And the connection is made. And of course, the corporate brands, how can they not be there, right? The conversation is taking place whether they're there or not. So whether you're a mom and pop business or medium size or super large scale, Twitter's appropriate. Again, remember, it's about engagement and it's about people. You know, whatever we're selling, whether it's pizza or dry cleaning or Apple computers, whatever it is, we're ultimately not in the business of products or services. We're in the people business and we're there to serve people. So with 284 million active accounts on a regular basis and growing, this is where the people are gathering. I like to say Twitter is the water cooler of our time where people are discussing anything and everything uh, within the parameters of Twitter, which are pretty broad. And of course, as you mentioned, media, uh, it's ubiquitous now. The, the hashtag really originated with Twitter and uh, the at sign and, and turn on any TV show, go to any movie, look in any magazine, turn on the radio and they're going to say, follow us on Twitter at our hashtag is. So it's permeated culture in such a way that I, I see, I don't see it being replaced very easily. I don't know who's going to come along and all of a sudden take over that trend. I think it's here to stay as far as media is concerned. And remember, media has got the biggest megaphone. Well, let's talk about um, creating content then and, and being the media outlet. Um, we, we see agencies do it. And, uh, you know, it was just the person who was creating their own content. Now, you know, businesses figured it out and they started creating content. We saw this years ago. They do it now and they do it on a ver variety of different uh, ways. And video content is really important. We see Vine stars. Vine is is huge and people are really popular on Vine, but they may not be that popular on YouTube or something else. But they're people that attract uh, consumers. And so brands reach out to them and they try to work out relationships with them. How... Um, how do you put all of these pieces, parts together? You've got Vine, you've got Instagram, you've got Twitter, you've got Facebook. I mean, what's the right formula? I don't think that there is a single formula. It starts with the individual. There's too many social networks for everybody to manage, right? It, everybody's saying, well, you need to be on LinkedIn and you should be doing videos on YouTube and you got to be creating stuff on Instagram and there's Pinterest and there's LinkedIn and there's, there's Facebook and there's Twitter and ah, pinch, you know, there's too many. How do you do it all? And I, I like to help people be free with their social media use. I make social media fit with who I am in my lifestyle rather than be a subject, a slave to social media. If everybody is shooting on you all the time and telling you what you should be doing, then you're probably not being authentic about who you are. And what I've discovered for myself and for others that, that, that I've helped coach is that those who use social media in a much more organic way, that is, I really enjoy pinning on Pinterest. This is what brings me happiness. This flows from my lifestyle. Well, those people are going to get the best results on Pinterest. Apply that to any social network. And so I don't have the time or the energy to do them all. So I do what I want. And really social media should be an extension of who you are and what your brand is all about and, and not bring your brand underneath this umbrella of all these things you've got to do. It's way too overwhelming and it's only going to get worse. Are you meerkatting or periscoping? I am meerkatting. In fact, look, here's the meerkat. <laughs> there he is. Um, my friend Courtney Kramer gave this to me at um, South By. Um, I was one of the ones that was blowing up meerkat just before South By. And then there on the streets of, I think we had, I don't know, 300 or so viewers when I was doing a live tweet chat with uh, Brian Kramer and Ted Rubin. And I, I love it. And uh, I really hope that Facebook or Google buys Meerkat because I like it just a little bit more than Periscope. I'm using both. In fact, uh, the other day I had my iPad 
and my iPhone right here in front of me on the screen, and I was doing a live tweet chat and streaming both of them at the same time, and it was a battle to see which one. And, you know, what I've discovered is a lot more people initially come on Periscope, but they're people who don't know who you are, right? There's not that direct connection like there is with the friends that you have on Meerkat. And so you get these kids wandering in going, who are you? This is stupid, you know? <laughs> and they're there, and then they're kids. gone. And, and Yeah, kids these days, what are you going to do? Um, I, Meerkat is holding its own pretty well. In fact, the numbers for Meerkat were higher for, than the numbers for Periscope during my, uh, my one-hour tweet chat. So I, I hope they get acquired and quickly. I think it would make great integration for Hangouts because people still aren't doing Hangouts mobile. And this would be, and, and it's interesting because it's the same basic idea. It's just streaming. I mean, we've been streaming uh, online for years. I did Ustream back when Ustream first came out. That's what we're doing and right so now. <laughs> we're doing it right now. It's nothing new, um, but the fact that we can just turn on our phone and go, boom, go live. People have just really latched onto it. And, and clearly for 2015 and going forward, live streaming uh, is not only it, but it becomes the can of worms as far as uh, legal copyright issues are concerned. You mentioned uh, South by Southwest, and I think historically that has been um, a an event uh, with your music, your film, and your interactive, specifically for interactive and marketers, where we go, we network, we see people, and occasionally, sometimes, an app will come out, like maybe a meerkat, that... Um, you know, Ben Rubin, who Leo interviewed on Triangulation here on Twit TV, um, said this was not some of the strategy that he had. It wasn't a, it wasn't about, you know, going to South by to get to it just happened. It was very organic that people um, started using it. And, and I would agree with you. I think streaming is going to be more and more um, something that as certainly as marketers, we have to pay attention to and how we want to utilize that into the uh, marketing mix. Right. Um, Absolutely. But there, but you also mentioned so, so. So let's start. What what? Why are marketers still interested in going to South by? Is it still relevant? I mean, is it something? Is it too crowded? I mean, I've been hearing every year people. I'm not going anymore. I'm not going this year. What was your big takeaway? And is it something that you think you'll want to do again next year? Uh, again, whenever I think marketing and growing my business, I think networking. I think you go where the people are. I'm not a big fan of sitting in sessions, and I'm a speaker. Uh, honestly, I can't sit still for very long. Uh, if if uh, I didn't have to be in my own session, I probably wouldn't be. I'd probably be in the hall <laughs> talking to, to other people because I feel like for me, uh, the education part is something that you can pick up anytime, but the face-to-face -face that you have with real people with a pulse, right, that, that you don't necessarily get the feeling for that online, you can only get that when you go to events. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm ambivalent about the number of sessions they have. I think there's a lot going on. I kind of wish the expo hall was a little bigger because I really enjoy seeing the, the latest products and technologies and talking to people there on the show floor. But honestly, as long as people are gathering and there are people in my industry, then I think it's a win. And, you know, I go to events that are as small as 50 or 100 people many times, and it's a huge win. How do you not turn tens of thousands of people into a win for you and your company? If, if you don't, you're sitting in your hotel room and you're not doing anything. You know, as far as the, the, the diehards say, oh, it's not relevant anymore and it's changed so much. And hello, welcome to life. Everything changes. Everything, you know, metamorphosizes from what is that a word? Did I, from one thing into, uh, into another. And so uh, I think the great philosophers, Ario Speedwagon once said, you got to roll with the changes. And uh, there's value wherever you go, as long as you're looking for it. You just said Ario Speedwagon. Was I did. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> I saw them last year here at Red Rocks. Woo! I, oh, I forget. Ever... That's right. You're Colorado. I'm now, how is it possible that I lived, I've only been in California a little over a year now. But I am from Colorado. I used to be on the radio there. In fact, I was on the radio in Denver on Bloom the Bloomberg Network with really? the Tanya Hall show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How is it that Did, we never So you've been, you've been to Red Rocks? You know I haven't. Shame. <laughs> well, you have to come I lived back. in Colorado Springs, actually. It, still. So I was actually close there yesterday. You had Pikes Peak. Beautiful. That's true. That's beautiful. True. But uh, Red Rocks is the best outdoor amphitheater maybe in the country. Natural acoustics. And it's just under the stars or the rain. 
if it might be. I just got my Van Halen tickets for Red Rocks. Oh, Van Halen. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm excited about it or if I'm scared because I heard David Lee Roth has become a, a caricature of his former self. You know, it, it's funny that you mentioned David Lee Roth. I think he's a good example of somebody that certainly branded himself, right? And we see people branding themselves all the time and, and we, we decide, you know, what our brand is going to be and what we represent. Uh, Callie Lewis, actually, um, uh, or Lorai, uh, has just started a new business and she said something on, on uh, one of our shows yesterday, Leah's show this week in Tag Twit, that she really decided that she was going to be who she was online. And we don't always see that. We see people like, okay, this is what my brand is going to represent and this is this, the kind of content that I'm going to put out there. And then we have maybe people just putting out who they really are and what's really happening to them. What is your school of thought? I mean, is as marketers, we, we like to try to come up with our brand message and we, we think, okay, well, this is what our brand is. This is what our brand does. This is what the, you know, this is what we want to put out there. Is that realistic or is it, do people connect better when they think it's really you and, and not, you know, some sort of brand image or brand messaging? I, you know, that's a great question. I think people buy from those that they like, know, and trust. And when you put forward a facade, right, unless people know it's a facade, like you're the onion, right? They, they get it. That, that is the gig. Um, it's always best to be authentic. Just be who you are. There's a lot of freedom, especially as a speaker and an author. Okay. I'll just speak from that perspective because that's what I do. Uh, somebody once told me that the speakers who have the hardest time are those who are one thing on stage and another off stage. It's, it's like pretending. And I, could, I won't name names, but there's a lot of people with big names that go on stage. They put on a show. They put on this front, and then they're off stage, and they're, they're different. And I want to be the same guy. I don't want to have to remember, wait, am I on? Am I off? Am I on a podcast? Am I just talking to a friend? I want to just be me. And uh, that's the good, the bad, and the ugly, regardless. And uh, if you like it, great. If you don't, okay. Guess what? The president of the United States can't get above 50% approval rating, so I don't expect everybody to like me. You know, it is what it is. And I think is a, I am my brand. And as, a, a, you know, if I was creating a product or a service, I think the more authentic and more real I am about why I've created this and how I think it's going to bring value, why, why I want to engage with you as a customer, the more that engagement is going to happen. Chat room says David Lee Roth is 60 years old. That can't be, right? Because that means <laughs> we're getting older too. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we are. Yeah. And and his hair is cut and he wears like a... He's a, got cut hair? A, like he doesn't have the long, crazy... No, band. no. What? He was, they were on um, Ellen, I think, last week and they did Jump. And I kind of cringed a little as I saw him doing his moves. It just... Like I say, he's going to become a character. So I got row 46 for the concert, which is good because I won't be able to see him up close. Wow. I, uh, that, that should be interesting. I'll, I'll look for your pictures on Instagram. Yes, you will. Well, you'll find them on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> Facebook and I don't, Twitter. I don't use Instagram a lot. It's, it's one of those things. It's on my phone, and sometimes I think I'll Instagram that, but it's not part of my lifestyle. One of the questions that we had was, how do you actually make money doing this? How do you make money tweeting or using uh, Twitter? I mean, what's an example of a business is actually making money using Twitter as their social media outlet? Well, apart from those that are advertising on Twitter, which are they're, they're paying for cards and they're driving traffic directly to their, their site and the offers, just like you would on Facebook or any other website that accepts advertising. And that's, that's very effective. Uh, for me, it's all about building relationship. It's all about conversation. I, you know, some people say that 20% of your time as a brand should be spent marketing and 80% engagement. I say that those numbers are still skewed. It should be 90 to 95% content and engagement and five, 10% max where you're actually pitching, selling, directing people to a product. Again, people buy from those they like, know, and trust. It's got to be in that order. Um, you know, when we like somebody on Twitter, well, we follow them. We say, all right, I'm up for seeing what you're all about. As we see their tweets and uh, discover if they bring value to the conversation, are these real people? Are they authentic? Do they really care about me? Are they engaging with me on a human level? We get to know them. And once we get to know somebody, we can trust them. So when you have like, know, and trust that is inculcated into the relationship, there was a $10 word for you there. Keep the change. Um, it is a short hop to buying something. 
You know, when, when, uh, when somebody says, hey, I want to sell my house, do you know a realtor? I think of my guy who's helped me because we have a great relationship. And I instantly want to say, you need to use this person. I think all brands uh, engage the same way. And so I don't say that I actually make money on Twitter, but the relationships I build are what uh, what create the opportunity for people to say, uh, purchase one of my products, get on my email list. Uh, participate in one of my meerkats and get to know me better so that when they think, you know, I really want to understand this Twitter thing better, who are they going to think of? Well, hopefully they'll think of me and they'll want to hire me to, uh, to consult with them or to come speak at one of their events or they'll go buy my book or uh, who knows, maybe we'll become friends in real life. And that happens also. You know, I want to talk about some of the biggest takeaways from your book. I also want to talk about um, blogging and some other specifics that we've seen change. And before I do, though, I want to thank a sponsor of Marketing Mavericks, which is Squarespace. This episode of Marketing Mavericks is brought to you by Squarespace.com. With Squarespace, it's easy for you to create a professional website, a blog, or online store. Squarespace features an elegant interface, beautiful templates, and incredible 24-7 customer support. In fact, I would say many of the guests we have come on share with me, I don't know, during the show or after the show that they actually used Squarespace to, I don't know, build their own website. And they thought it was super easy. You know, a lot of what we're talking about on the show today is using social media, but you want to push those people back to your own place, your own website, your own messaging, maybe, and which is something we're going to talk about blogging, you want to build a blog. Well, Squarespace can help you do that. It's simple, powerful, and beautiful. Making changes is clearer and simpler than ever. And it's so incredibly easy to use that. And if you want some help, even even though it is easy, Squarespace has live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Squarespace starts at just $8 a month and they take care of the hosting so you don't have to. Plus you get a free domain name if you buy Squarespace for a year. All Squarespace websites are responsive and scale to look great on any device. E-commerce is also available. Every website comes with a free online store. With cover pages, you can set up a beautiful one-page online presence in minutes. It's perfect for creating quick landing pages for your brand, personal identity, or to promote a new product. So start a trial with no credit card required and start building your website today. When you sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code MM to get 10% off of your first purchase. And we thank Squarespace for their support of Marketing Mavericks. Squarespace, built it beautiful. And I think, you know, especially as we go further with Joel with this conversation um, about what you need to do to kind of set up creating your own content, you do need a website to do that. You need a, a, your homepage and you need a, a place to send people, um, whether it's, um, you, you know, for e-commerce reasons or maybe because you've, you're a media outlet, you've got content that you want to share. Um, you need a place to go. How important is building a blog, in fact? It's essential. In fact, it's the core of any online strategy. You you cannot depend upon anybody else's platform to always be there for you. And it's foolishness to build your business completely on another's platform. You want to have your own home. And I've always had my own sites. And really the goal of social media is to engage with people to a level that you can invite them over to your house. They come to your blog. They come to your e-commerce site. They they read your content. They consume it. Perhaps they even comment on your site. They share your content on your site. And, and hopefully they subscribe to what? Uh, to your list as well. And you can see there's some of the things that, uh, that I've blogged yep. about. In fact, you've got I'm your site thinking, pulled up here for those people who aren't watching. Yep. And, uh, there's my April fools, um, little <laughs> joke that got a bunch of tweets. No, not that the book was released that, <laughs> that they're increasing the character limit to 141 characters. And that was a, a fun little piece. And so you have to have your blog I, I, I think it's essential and it, because if the rules change on any of the sites and that never happens, yeah, <laughs> uh, you could be left completely in the dark and Google changes, you know, algorithms, they, Google Plus has changed how many times, you know, it used to be that we had our little profile image show up next to our blog posts and people figured out how do we leverage that and then, oh, if you get a Google Plus account, it's good for SEO and so people are scrambling to leverage that and then they change those tools and you just never know what's going to happen. So use the platforms, but use them wisely and always invite people 
valuable to your home. What's a trick that maybe, um, or, or, or a technique, if you will, uh, to using one of these sites like Twitter or Facebook that people don't always realize, um, but you maybe have it in your book or something that you utilize? Yeah, there is an art to tweeting. There really is. And, and, and a lot of it is just understanding um, how humans like to engage. We all like to feel like we know stuff. Right. And so Twitter is a great place to ask and answer questions. You can find a lot of great content ideas and you can help a lot of people and pull them into the conversation. So if somebody asks a question and you know the answer, this is a great opportunity to tweet and share your answer and maybe a link to some content that you have. But even more so, if you have a question, you put it out there and all of a sudden you find your engagement goes up because everybody likes to provide an answer. And those answers, they can be valuable. Somebody could actually know what they're talking about. They could be totally off the wall and wrong and just engaging, or they could just be snarky and have fun. Uh, we do that a lot in social media. It's easier for to, so it's very easy for us to just think we're being clever. But regardless, it's all engagement. And if it's all done with the purpose of engaging, um, then somewhere in there, you're going to not only find the answer that you're looking for, but you're going to pull new people into the conversation. What are some of your favorite, um, you know, th- third party sites that help you with managing your Twitter profile. For example, there are, um, you know, apps that you can use to unfollow. There are apps that you can use to find the right people to follow. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, strategies to, to building up the big fan base that people say that they want. Ah, oh, looky here. What is that? You, you so cleverly asked the question. We actually have a list of uh, third-party tools in the back of the book, a social oomph, um, Twitter feed, tweet beep, Twitter counter. You know, you can watch to see how many people are following and unfollowing you. Of course, Hootsuite, very popular um, for managing across the social sphere your, your multiple accounts. And what you're going to find, you'll probably laugh at this, but if you saw my web browser, I have Twitter and Facebook and Google Plus and LinkedIn open all the time. I'm very organic. Maybe it's old school, but I enjoy just going directly to the sites and I manage my accounts that way. But, you know, a lot of people are using tools like Sprinkler. You know, we uh, offline, we talked a little bit about our friend Ekaterina Walter, who's the evangelist for Sprinkler. And uh, they, they like these third party tools. And I say, whatever works for you, whatever helps you better manage your use of social media so that you want to use it so that it doesn't feel like this burden. Again, I I go back to how many times we're told what we should be doing. And you know, that, that we get that when we're kids, get our finger wagged at us, all the things we should be doing. Hey, we're grown adults here for the most part, you know, and none of us like to be told what to do. Find what works for you. Find the tools that you connect with that help you have a quality of life that is, again, here's the word, authentic. Authentic. Yeah, we use that word a lot. But, you know. A lot, lot of choice. Oh, I don't think it's worn out. I don't. I don't think you can wear it out. I think we need to be reminded again and again because there's a lot of people out there that are being posers. Posers. Stop it, Poser. posers. <laughs> no posing. <laughs> no posing. I uh, I would agree with you, and I said what uh, what she, what uh, Lorai said uh, yesterday was um, is that you say her name? Is that, did I say it right? Luria. Luria. It's so beautiful. But this is why she went by Callie Lewis because she was worried people wouldn't be able to say her name. And I really like that point of view. Um, and I even told her that that um, this idea of just people just embracing who you are and then putting it out there for people because, as you've said, the word authentic and that people want to get to know you. And I do think it is about <laughs> authentic allegedly. Um, it, it is about it's relationships. kind of creepy. <laughs> like a little bunny attacking. That's what everybody thought this was Speaking close. It actually means the rabbit attack is imminent. Little bunny foo-foo. Yeah, hopping through the forest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had too much caffeine. Okay, the other part of your business isn't just helping people understand how to use different platforms and what's working, what's not. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that aren't working and maybe some of the takeaways that people have had uh, and why they ask you to come speak at their events. But before I do that, I want to actually also talk about just being an author in general. You have been very successful. In, you're listed, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, New York Times bestselling author. And there are a lot of people that can, my, my cousin Dwayne just wrote a book and he's like, it's flying off the shelves. And, and, 
and people are always trying to decide, you know, it, for themselves is, is being an author, writing a book, is that something I should invest my time in? Maybe they have time for blogs, but they haven't actually decided to write a book. What, what was this? What was the tipping point for you? The first book that you wrote? I mean, what made you decide to write something and, 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 and why was it successful? Well, interestingly, interestingly enough, my first book was in 1997, and uh, my first site, worldvillage.com, did reviews of uh, family-friendly software and sites. And so my first book was called Internet Family Fun, The Parent's Guide to Safe Surfing. And I co-authored it with uh, Bonnie Bruno out of Oregon. And it wasn't a big hit. And the first time out, you know, it was on No Starch Press, and we sold a few copies, and it was okay. The first big hit was actually my second book that came in 2006, and it was very organic. Again, um, you can't always plan for these things. You just kind of have to follow the rabbit down the hole and see where it goes. And in 2004, I uh, I bounced back from the dot com bust, which we all remember so fondly. And uh, I was making money with Google AdSense. I was one of the first ones to really discover um, how you monetize the content on your site with AdSense. And I shared my strategies with some friends, including our, our buddy uh, Chris Perillo. And I remember messaging him and saying, you need to change your ads so that they do this, this, and this. And he told me he was too busy and he'll look at it later. And the next day I got an instant message from him that was all caps. It was, dude. And he saw his AdSense earnings just shoot up. And uh, he and a few others suggested that I take it and I put it into an ebook. So I said, really? I wrote this ebook. It was about 66 pages. Thing went nuts. Thousands of copies of the first and the second and the third edition sold for $97. And I was introduced to uh, David Hancock at Morgan James Publishing. And uh, he said, you know, I think the content in your book would make for a good traditionally published book. And he explained to me why. And what I learned is that authoring a book, a physical book, gives you a level of credibility and authority that an ebook doesn't. In fact, having a book, I think, is the low hanging fruit to offer more credibility and authority to just about any content creators of any stripe than just about anything else you can do. Uh, it's, it's really not a complicated process. And there's something about books that we go, oh, you're a published author. You have a book. And it opens the doors for speaking engagements, interviews on, on podcasts and video streams, uh, guest blogging, uh, sponsorships, consulting, training opportunities, uh, brand ambassadorships, all kinds of doors open up when you are a published author, whether you've got a big bestseller or not. Just having the credibility that's in the book, um, perception is reality, and we give great credence to people who are published authors. And so I'm a huge fan of, uh, of, of leading the charge for people to publish their book. Do you self-publish? Uh, you know, I've only self-published one time. I've uh, published four books with uh, John Wiley and Sons and six with uh, Morgan James, which has a really interesting model. They've taken the best of the traditional publishing world, which is the distribution without all the the good old boys club of, you know, not getting any royalty and not getting in advance and not giving a crap really about the author and self-publishing, which basically is I'm in full control of, uh, of my work. I own it and it's to benefit me um, and those that I want to read it. He's merged the two of them into a model called entrepreneurial authoring, which is if the two were to have a love child that was the best of both worlds, that's what it would look like. And uh, there's a lot of freedom in it and still the power to be able to get distribution. And so I'm a big fan of these new emerging models. So if if somebody were to, to check out your book and, um, and, and read it, what do you think their biggest takeaway would be? From Twitter Power 3.0? Yeah. Look at that. Plug right there. Uh, yeah, twitterpower.com, by the way, if anybody wants to uh, get a look at it. Um, I think the biggest takeaway would be, uh, first of all, a philosophy of how to approach social media. Uh, I think we get bogged down in the um, the tech of it all, right? And, and, and uh, all the pundits out there that tell you, here's the right way to tweet. Uh, first and foremost, I want people to get a sense of what the like me, know me, trust me, pay me philosophy really looks like in the social space. And to understand that when they're engaging in social media, 
it's real life. These are real people that you're talking to. We have somehow, in, in uh, many respects, become disconnected by becoming so uber connected. You know, we're at our computers and we're, we're often by ourselves just typing away and we don't get that human to human face to face interaction with others. And I think it's important to remember that everybody on the other side of your posts and your tweets and your comments and your likes and your shares are people with hopes and dreams and fears and wishes and likes and dislikes. And remember, we're connecting with real people. And that's a starting place. If you just approach social media as, hey, this is my uh, soapbox in the middle of town square and I've got my megaphone, you're doing it wrong. Who's somebody that is maybe a peer uh, in the space that you think is doing a really good job uh, and uh, you kind of admire their work? Uh, in, in the social space? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, um, well, I'm dear friends now with uh, Brian Kramer of uh, Pure Matter out of uh, San Jose, yeah, and Brian on the show before. I, I love uh, I love what he and his team are doing. How they're working with big brands like uh, like IBM and Cisco and their social teams to help connect with people. You know, I I've been to a couple IBM events in the last year, and something has changed at Big Blue. The the social team there, they get it. And, uh, you know, it's no more with the pinstripes and the wingtips. It's like these are real people that are energized. They're young. They're vibrant. They love what they're doing. They love the brand and they're being innovative. And so, you know, I love when I see um, people working with these corporations that are, are bringing this this new generation and this new vibe. And uh, he's just a super nice guy. And I'm actually doing one of his uh, shareology tweet chats a little later today. So I get to do two awesome shows today. <laughs> I've done a tweet. I used to do a lot of tweet chats. I used to do them with uh, Jeff Hazlett, actually. Um, yeah. Kodak he guy. He, that's how he got his start. That's right. Well, it's, he's got started long before that, but he became well known in the marketing space for being uh, the CMO of Kodak. He's certainly moved on. He's got a couple of his own shows and he does the C-suite network. And, um, and he's super smart. He's, he's wicked smart at branding himself. That's for sure. I mean, yeah. Uh, it, you know, I think he's a great example of somebody who is able to really continuing to push forward, building a brand like yourself um, from the standpoint of, you know, uh, everything that he's done. And I think that's that's really smart. And there's a lot of people that do that. You, in, in fact, a lot of what he does is also like yourself is the public speaking. How, do, how does somebody get started doing that? I mean, do, do you know, I've, I get this question a lot and I do some public speaking um, and I've given advice on it, but what, what advice would you give to somebody who maybe they've already authored a book, maybe they, um, they've got a great blog or they get a good social presence, they do some consulting, but they really want to get into the speaking circuit. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm going to start with the assumption that you've got a book because if you don't, that really is a first step. It, it does open a lot of doors. Once you've got that, to just get practice, do Toastmasters, go to some local associations, speak at high schools or colleges, offer up your expertise there just so you can get experience. But ask yourself, what events am I a good fit for, right? Am I in the internet marketing space and I want to go to traffic and conversion? You know, am I talking about the latest and interactive? I'd like to speak at South by Southwest. Uh, figure out where it is you want to speak and go to those events right? See what people are saying, get the, get a feeling for the vibe. And then, you know, a lot of these events, they don't pay you outright to go speak. You know, I just, I just spoke at social media marketing world and, and that's the type of thing that it's a who's who of the social media world. And we all want to get on the platform there because we know even if we're not getting paid, it's going to build up our, our brand and it's going to lead to more business. But you... most of these well, I was, let me just finish here that most of these uh, events will have a call for speakers and you just go to the site and you fill in the form, say, here's who I am. Here are my credentials. Here's the topic I want to speak on. Here's the description of the session. And then you wait to hear back from them. And sometimes just putting yourself out there is all that's needed. And then when you get that time on the platform, you better deliver. Because if you do, you don't know who's sitting in that audience that will then say, you know, I want to talk to our uh, CMO about having you come speak to our company or to do training, consulting, or, or whatever other event is. But it's really all about going to these events and putting yourself out there. You mentioned driving traffic. Um, you've mentioned it several times. In fact, you talked about, you know, SEO and AdSense and that sort of thing. And and that has certainly changed and evolved. What <clears> is, what is, 
what is, has been the evolution of driving traffic? What, what, what tools or what metrics do you think work today, literally today, uh, that might not have worked even just a year ago? Well, I still think one of the old tried and true methods is email. I think when you've got an email list of people who have valued you enough and what you offer to subscribe and said, yes, I'm willing for your email to land in my box, that's powerful stuff. But now we have social and social does drive traffic, whether it's through paid advertising and we're discovering a lot of people are driving significant traffic through Facebook ads, through Twitter ads, through Pinterest. Um, but again, when you're building that relationship and people are following what you're saying, you can post a link to your site within an article and it's amazing how many people will click through. I just, I tested this, um, I think eight days ago, I started a campaign on uh, teespring.com. I decided to come up with my first t-shirt brand. It's uh, teespring.com forward slash do good stuff. Created this t-shirt based on the signature line I use for all my emails. My philosophy is that if you do, there it is, if you do good stuff, regardless of what it is you do, if you keep a positive mindset, that good stuff comes back around to you. And so I created this, this logo. I had it done at um, 99designs.com. There's my happy little guy. And I thought, you know, I'm going to put this out there on Facebook and see if my tribe responds. And if you scroll down, you can see, okay, we got 114 of these uh, that people purchase. And this is a great start to a brand. And I've got the domain dogoodstuff.com and I'm setting that up and getting stickers printed. And I just want to have a message to encourage people to just like, just be nice to other people. This is not rocket science. Just whatever you do, make sure it's good, that you're doing good in the world. And this traffic all came from my posts on Facebook and Twitter. There you go. Be nice. I, you know, I had, nice. you mentioned Pinterest a couple of times. Is your, is your t-shirt pinned on Pinterest? You know, amazingly it's not because I, it, it, I know it totally should be. I haven't gotten around to it. I just got done with the book launch. I just started you know, following this, you. I just looked you up right now. Joel, crazy calm on Pinterest. You've it got might be. Take a look. Do you 28 see it out there? words. I'm a big pinner. <clears throat> Are you? Yeah. Because like nails and clothing and, you know, <laughs> cupcakes and stuff, right? Cupcakes. I guess that's what yeah. Pinterest is about. I'm really, I like, uh, there's my Pinterest. I have 108 boards. Yeah, look at you go. Am I in the Tanya Hall show guest thing? or is Not it yet. We, okay. We'll have to add you to that. I need to update Ca that, actually. Capture this screenshot. There you go. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I do think Pinterest is a really powerful tool, but certainly uh, there are lots of great tools out there and there's lots of great ways to use the web. And I guess what's the biggest, the, the most popular question that you get asked about how internet marketing works and, and the best advice you could give somebody besides well, big, be yourself? Yeah, the biggest question I get is, is calm your real name? <laughs> Oh, okay. And, and it really is. Uh, but people want to know how they get started making money online again and again. That's what I get. How do I make money online? And uh, my answer uh, surprises a lot of people because a lot of people say, well, you, you create a product and you do this and you do that. And I say, go to an event. Go to a live event and just network with people. Ask questions and find out how you can help. If you listen and you, you're not talking about yourself, but you listen to what the needs of the people in your niche are, you're going to start to hear a message again and again that's going to resonate with you personally. And you're going to, the little lights going to go on. You're going to be like, you know what, this thing that people need, I think I can provide a solution to that. And that's really what the best brands are doing. They, there's a problem and there needs to be a solution. And if you can be the person that sees that need and creates the solution to that problem, you've got a business. And I think everybody, you know, the way we're put together with our unique passions, talent, skills, ability, personality, that we're all designed in a way that the value we bring is unique from what anybody else can do. Might be in the same niche or market, but the way we communicate it is going to be unique. This is why we can have a dozen, uh, you know, new diets each year because somebody's figured out something that works for them and then they share it with others. And maybe it'll work for some of the other people. This is why we've got all these different fitness, you know, regimens. Because what works for one person might not work for another. And it's a matter of finding out what that fit is. So to, to really get going on your business, go to where people are, ask them questions, and listen to what they say. I believe you're going to tap into something that resonates with your heart and your mind that you're going to want to pursue. 
Well, there's a lot of great tools out there. You offer some great advice in your book, with including some of the favorite third-party apps that you use. And if somebody wants to follow you, maybe they want to check out your book, hire you to speak at an event, or just meet you at one of these events, what's the best way they can connect with you, Joel? Uh, so my blog, joelcom.com, as you see on our lower third there. Uh, and find me anywhere in the social space. Really, Facebook and Twitter is where I spend the most time. So send me a DM, tweet me, whatever. Just connect and, and you'll discover that this guy is the same guy there. Um, and if you meet me in person, you'll go, hey, you're that same guy. And I'll be, yep, that's me. That's you. Well, it was great finally meeting you, even though it's not face-to-face -face exactly. We'll meet you soon. Hopefully you can come up to Petaluma and maybe visit our studio here uh, at the Brickhouse. I would love to do that. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Have a great day. That was Joel Calm, everybody. He is a best-selling New York Times best-selling author. He's uh, written quite a few books and he speaks at a lot of different events. You should absolutely follow him. And I think you should probably follow him on Twitter. He's really engaging. He will respond to you. It's a real, he's the real deal. And if you want to follow me, you can do that. In fact, we want to hear from you. You can email us your thoughts and ideas by going to uh, mavericks at twit.tv. That's mavericks at twit.tv. And if you have your own advice on how you best use, send us your really quick you know, five second, 10 second uh, uh, video of how you use social media to promote business. Maybe it's your favorite app. Maybe it's a technique that you use. If you can keep it short and entertaining and we can learn something, we'll actually post it here on our show. That's right. We'll show your video on how you use social media. So send it to me at mavericks at twit.tv. And uh, follow me on social media as well. You can follow me by going to at Tanya Hall Radio on Twitter, or you can find me on Facebook. I love hearing your suggestions, whether it's guest ideas or how you use social media, everybody. And until next Thursday, have a great week. Thanks for tuning in.